personal growth and development. I think you've all got a um, copy, hard copies of this. I've slightly changed it, uh, but uh, it shouldn't be a major change. Okay, that's a bit about myself. I've been around for a while. You can see from my hairline that uh, uh, I'm on the right side of 50. Okay, and work through Australia, throughout the world. Uh, my organisation has over 700 worldwide clients. Uh, I've been coming to Fiji since 2001. I have about 50 clients here, varying from uh, a range of organisations, from big organisations out to smaller ones. So it's a whole range. Also, there's a book which we'll talk a bit more about later on. I regularly present at conferences. Just yesterday, I got invited to go to Dubai in the Arab part of the world to present there in November. And I've been running master classes and training sessions for executives for about 15 years. And before that, I was a senior manager myself. Okay, so there's some of the clients in the Asian Pacific area that I've worked with. You might be familiar with some of those. You've got copies of these, and that means since you've got a copy of the PowerPoints, so I can go at a, at a faster speed. Okay, so this is what we're going through definitions, background, psychometric testing. The Myers Briggs is the basic one that most people are familiar with, looking at IQ, and you are here because you've got good IQs, you have to be academically pretty bright, but EQ is the important one, it's what your character is like, and you want to get to the top of your organisation or your profession, you have to have the EQ as well. And then there's the new one, which is the spiritual quotient, which is the spiritual intelligence, and we'll talk a bit about that as well. Character and successful executives, you're all heading that way and also some self-awareness activities if we have time. Okay, there's a definition. They tell me you can read faster than I can talk, so I'll let you read that. I can't see. Okay, bring it Characteristics, of, uh, this is understanding your personality. And this is a quote from Lord Winston, who is a... Uh, Sort of well known writer and also around the medical area. It's basically saying that at, at birth, a lot of your characteristics have been sorted out. And by what you do after that, you can improve it or make it worse. So, you're obviously, the genes you, you get from your parents are pretty important, and the environment will work on top of that. So, that, that, that's what it's saying. I'll, I'll summarise it rather than read the whole lot. Okay, so a, a question amongst you at the moment, just talk to people around you. How much do you think your genes and or environment has influenced your behaviour? A lot of it takes a lot of effort. It feels unnatural. And so it, what we're talking about is, is, pre is preference. And that's what a lot of the psychometric tests are about, are telling what your preference is. You can still do it the other way, but you don't do it as well. And so forth. So it's... And also, we, we talk about that in change. It's important to change. Your brain's hardwired to do it, say, with your right hand. It's not hardwired to do it with the other hand. I had one client who, when he was 21, lost his wrist. Therefore, he had a hook on his, on his, uh, on his right hand. He was a right-hander. He still kept signing with his right hand. He didn't change the left hand with it and so on because he's so conditioned to using his right hand. And so your brain gets condition that way. So, and what we go on a bit further, you, you'll sort of see what we're talking about. So, psychometric testing is one way of determining, finding out who you are. So, what's the, the basic premise? It's the people's ability to do a job is determined by the inherent qualities and abilities rather than qualifications and achievement. It includes your cognitive ability, tests to measure your numeracy, etc and to measure your character and so forth. So it's a, it's a range of things and these tests are set up to help do this. What are the aim? It's to, so you select people who are most likely to perform, who fit happily in your organisation, so that's what you're using these tests for, have a good working relationship with their colleagues. For example, someone who values order and discipline is not likely to perform well in a creative or relaxed environment. So these tests help find out your preferences and therefore help allocate you to the right groups, the right team. So that, that, and you understanding yourself. So the tests are devised to measure these type of 
characteristics, including personality and intellectual abilities, but they're not no good on their uh, on their own. You've got to use them on other things. They're just another test. They can't be the be all and end all. So if you're using them in recruitment, you should also use them by uh, additional things like interviewing, checking of the references, checking where they've worked. So don't use them on the, in their isolation. Use them with other methods. Like if you are interviewing somebody for a job, they can do this test, but bring also make contact with people who work with them, find out what they really like. And don't necessarily just go on their references, say, I want to talk to people who work with you in other workplaces. So the positive that is these they're, they're reliable, a fair amount of fairness attached to it, and there's they're good predictors. Not always, not 100% accurate, but good predictors. So I need to be careful of, at the same time, I need to be careful that people don't use it in playing the power games. People don't say, because I'm an invert, I'm, I always act, only act this way. When you talk about introvert and extrovert, you all have a percentage of each. Some people have a preference more for others. And that people feel that they uh, understand the brain by understanding these tests. The brain's a bit more complex than that. So they can be faked, and there is a gender bias in some of these tests, so be careful that one. And you could have, have just had a bad day when you're doing the test. Just didn't feel well or whatever. Or came in a grumpy mood. Higher score does not necessarily mean that you're a better person. It just means you have a preference for one thing or the other. Sometimes the dimensions can be linked and personalities are not static, you are developing over time. For example, I'm a strong introvert, therefore running these sessions initially about 20 years ago, I found it very hard. I used to be really exhausted afterwards. But by doing it more often, I've built up that side. And so my preference has probably changed a bit from what it was, say, 20 years ago. So don't use them as a disguise to say, I'm an ABC, therefore I don't do these things. We'll talk a bit about the concept of the, of the grip later on. And, and, and also, there's a, there's a sucker born every minute. Sometimes these are used to, just to flatter people and so forth. So, and the individual tests, not group tests. Now, the Miners Briggs is the most commonly used one. A lot of variations of that. You'll find every consultancy group will tell you they've got the, the personality test for you or your organisation. Generally, the basis for them is, is the Miners Briggs. It's sort of the, the father or the mother of them. And that it talks about 16 different types. It answer multi-choice questions. There's no right or wrong preference. They're just ones that are more suitable in certain situations. That helps people understand the differences. You understand why a person reacts one way as a, another way. I was in one group and we divided them into two groups based on their tests and the exact opposites. We gave them one exercise to do, which was you have a, a wedding and you only have seats for 100 people, but you've got to invite two, 200 people. One group said, bug up, we just cut it off at 100. Other groups said, oh no, no, we'll have to have two weddings and we've got to keep people all on the side. So, same question, but different groups had a different answer because of their preferences and their personalities. Okay, so that's the many situations it's used in. It's a whole, you can see it's used in a, a great range of situations. And so forth. It's based on four scales. Looking at your extrovert, introvert, that's where your source of energy. Because you're an extrovert doesn't mean because you can yell and talk and, and so forth. You like being with other people. You get your energy from other people. If you're an introvert, you get your energy from yourself. Or more from yourself. Okay, if you're an extrovert, you like me on other people. Also, how do you gather information? Do you prefer the facts or relationships to gather your information? Next one. Also, how do you make decisions and judgments? That's the third criteria. And then, in how do you, what way do you live your life? How do you relate to the outside world? So, they're the four main ingredients that are then broken into 16 different types. Now, who's completed the Myers Briggs? Anyone done a Myers Briggs? Oh, well, some hands up going in. So, what were you? I N. I N. I'll just have a look at the next. I N. 
Where, where is it on that list? I N. I N T P. I N T. Where are we? But where about are we? On the, on the, down. On the left. Architect. Architect, is it? Okay, that's you. Right? That describes mastermind. <laughs> okay. that, that's a very brief summary of the different 16 different types. So if you have it done, that tells basically what type of person you are. And as you see, I'm an INTPF. Right? That's, that's the type of person I am. That was done literally 10 years ago. Now I probably need to upgrade it to see whether it's changed. So, by that will tell you what type of person you, you are and help other people explain. But don't use it as an excuse for doing things your way as opposed to other people's way. Don't say because I'm an INTP, therefore I must do things this way. No, it just means your preference is that way, you still do it the other way. Anybody else? Try it? Okay. So if you get a chance to do it, and, and, and I always insist on our psychologists, a trained psychologist doing it, because it's, a, it's pretty important that you get it right. And so on. I, don't, I don't actually do it myself when I'm, I, I bring in a friend who's a trained psychologist to, to do it, and they test is sent, sent away to be analysed. But there are variations of it. As I say, each consulting group I know of will tell you they've got a better, a better one than that. But it's all the variation of this, basically. Okay, so this is them spelled out in more detail. And I won't go through those, you, you can read them at your leisure. So it's the whole, the whole 16. This is the interesting one, this is the call of the grip. This is the reverse, this is the one you least prefer. As I was explaining before, I used to find these presentations used to be very exhausting. I virtually had to go and have a rest after doing it. But by doing it over a 20 year period, it's now second nature to me. I've learned to handle the grip, the reverse. Of it. And that's a bit of a, that can be a challenge for you, but that's something you want to work on. Makes you a better person when you're, you're pushed out of your zone of comfort and you have to do things a bit differently. And you, in this course, have a great chance to, to do things like that because you're in a safe environment, you're in a learning environment, you can make mistakes here that maybe you can't do in the workplace. So don't be frightened to push yourself out of your zone of comfort at times. And that's when you learn a lot about yourself when you do things like that. So that's the grip, which is the reverse of what you prefer, your preference. Now I want to go to another type of looking at intelligence. This is from Howard Gardner, a, a, a fellow who's written about their multiple intelligence. And the first three are the major ones, the visual, the verbal and the body. Then there are other ones are, are more minor. So, if you're with a group of people, and I normally say, do you see what I'm saying and put my hands up here, and people go click, 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 that means they're visual. Do you hear what I say when the hands are out here? They go click, 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 that means auditory. Or do you feel or do what I say when your hands are out here? It's a simple way of determining how people basically perform and learn. It's called the multiple intelligence. And it talks about other ones down there as well, uh, interpersonal, naturalist, they, they are also. But the top three are the most important ones. And if you're a good at the, at the top one there, and the second one, you're normally very good at school, academically. They're the ones you need to be academic. So most of you people would be very strong in that. I'm more of a doer in the sense, if you give me a computer manual, I don't read it. I'm as a throw it in the rubbish bin or use it as a doorstop. Somebody shows me how to use the computer, I take rough notes, and then I'm off and running. That's the way I learn. And you, when you're with your work people in your groups and also back at your office, find out which is the way they learn. Some people, you can write memo after memo to them, and they take no notice. But you sit down and talk to them across the table, they understand. The classical one was President Kennedy. He could read thousands of words a minute, so all his aides were writing lengthy reports. When Johnson became president, he was a doer. He'd have common breakfast meetings every morning and wheel and deal across the, the breakfast table. So all these lengthy reports drive him mad. So I find out, I've had bosses, there's no good writing memos to, you have to talk to them. 
or demonstrate. So amongst your co-workers, find out which way they perform best. And if they're doers, well, you do it. You draw it, or whatever. If they're people who like writing, write it. If they're people who like hearing it, verbalise it to them. Isn't it? So you learn how your bosses and your co-workers take things in best way and you put it in the format that suits them. Okay, this is testing whether you're you, you are lost, averse. In other words, you have an aversion for loss, etc. Answer that question. If you're offered a, a gamble on the toss of a coin, if the coin shows tail, you lose $100. Well, let, let's make it Australian dollars, so it's US dollars, okay? It's worth a bit more. If the coin shows head, you lose 150 Is that gamble attractive? Which one would you accept? Put your hand up if you, you'd say, no, that's not attractive, I wouldn't accept it. Put your hand up. Okay. So, okay. so we asked the other, others, put, others would, would accept it. So this is, this is the answer which you might have read already. Oops, speak about the wrong way. Okay, so that's the answer. So you, you're not, if you didn't take that bet, you're not really a risk taker. If you said, no, I don't want to take the bet, you, you don't like taking risks. And that can depend on the, on the stage of life you're in, the whole lot of reasons. I mean, you get to my age, you probably come less, take less risks, and so on. When you're younger, your age, you're more likely to take risks. So it is a link bit with the stage, but that's a simple test that they've proved is a good way of, of testing it. They find with the, to swing the risk, people who are against it, if you say that they have a gain of over $200, a lot more people will take the risk. 150 is, 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 the, is the borderline case. Again, this is Western orientated, uh, you might have a different view, but that's a simple test to work out how adverse people are. Okay, we're going to talk now about the th three different types of intelligence. It's a summarise, it's IQ, EQ and SQ. So we'll go through those. IQ is the, basically the academic, I mean you, you to be at this level would have high, high IQs, right? But if you want to succeed in the world, you've also got to have high, oops, I'll get it right. You've got to have a high EQ, which is the emotional thinking. Right. So simple examples of, of that type of thing, is like the Iraqi war was on and a, a, a group of British uh, officers go into a a town that's very famous in the Muslim world has got a mosque that's sort of, uh, uh, you know, it is one of those sort of sacred sites. The locals were very frightened that the unbelievers or the infidels would go into the mosque. They formed a guard with, in front of it to stop anybody, stop these military, British military people going in. Now, what would normally happen then, quite often, there would be a bit of Doing and throwing, yelling and screaming, and shots are probably fired there, and he would have a, a wholesale riot. But the head officer of those troop of soldiers realised that was a, what the situation was like. He made all these soldiers go down on one knee, point their guns into the ground, and he went up and negotiated. That's what emotion tells us. It's, it's understanding the other side and how you get out of those situations. Not following, I'm bigger than you, therefore we've got the weapons to get out of our way type of thing. Two more examples like that. There's a, a lady uh, hostess at an airport and she has to make the announcement that the plane has been delayed. This fellow dressed in a suit, very full of self-importance, expensive suit, expensive shoes, etc. And a shirt stripes up to the counter, thumps it, and says, do you know who I am? She picks up the mic and says, can somebody please come up here and identify this gentleman? He doesn't know who he is. <laughs> the fuse, that, that, that's the, and, and the third one, which I saw on an airplane, I was giving a, a talk in Orlando, and I was flying from LA to Orlando, and also hopping on the plane with a lot of Hispanic people, and there's a big family. You can see the real big, compound family with the grandparents right down to the grandkids and they're all talking in their local language uh, which wasn't English and they hopped on the plane they wouldn't sit together but they've been dispersed for the plane and, and one of the uh, elderly ladies came up to the hostess who happened to be next to us by chance and said can you please help us uh, we want to sit together and we've asked people to move and they're saying no they won't move this is my seat I'm not going to move 
So the lady says, no problem. She grabs all the sick bags and says, give one of these sick bags to each of the children in the group and say them. Remember the last time you fl uh, flew in an aeroplane and you vomited everywhere? This time, do it in the sick bag. Everyone moved. <laughs> she says, it works every time. <laughs> and you wouldn't get that in your normal customer management training and so on. So that's what EQ is about. It, it's a, being understanding the situation and finding the best way of getting out of it. And it's not necessarily going to be the rational way, etc. Now the last one is the, the SQ, which is a um, is, is one that I, I've struggled with all my life. I was a senior manager and suppliers used to fly me down to the Melbourne Cup. So I'd sit in a corporate box overlooking the finishing line and they'd pay for everything. Now they didn't invite me down because I was a great guy. I was, in a, I was a decision maker that could affect the buying of that equipment. I got to, to and even came down to, they used to give us jumpers with their logos on, etc. So that's the real, you know, that's a hard one. And believe it or not, one of the biggest industries in the world is bribery and corruption. And at some stage you're all going to be face that issue of how do you handle that one. And that's a personal choice. I can't make it for you what you do or don't do. Uh, and we Australians can't really lecture. We've just had a, a politician get away with 100000 or $100 million. He's now going through the courts, but uh, etc. So every country's got it, and so on. And it's a hard one to answer. How do you handle that one? It's your ethics, uh, and so on. It's, uh, it's not easy. It's very easy to get, what I say, holier than thou, you know, up on a pedestal and dictate and so forth. But it's your own personal beliefs that's going to determine how you handle it. So the IQ, which is the stuff you get really in your education, the education system, especially at the schools. Now, there are nine cognitive biases you have. Now, the diploma group will recognise that most of those are the three additional ones I've put on since I ran the course at the bottom. And so, so just amongst yourselves, just discuss and I think the explanation there, can you read it at the back okay? Well, you've got a copy of it anyway, haven't you? And there are nine different things. Just have a look at one or two of those in your groups and just sort of see a situation where that bias has happened in the workplace. Confirmation bias, it means you look for evidence that's going to support your point of view. You ignore the other evidence. The next one's anchoring. You put too much weight on one best bit of information. Heuristic is where you your preferred option, you minimise the risk while you exaggerate the benefits, and, and vice versa if it's something you dislike. Motivated error is where you just uh, self deception, you basically lie. I mean, a classical one that is a budget time, you've the, in the, you have put your budget up and you're competing against other people, well, you'll probably stretch the truth a bit on a certain point to try and get more money in your budget. Not, next one's not proper uh, about survivability, not assessing mistakes and assuming that past successes will repeat themselves. A halo effect, where you sort of the first impression dominates, something walks through the door, you put them in a box straight away, and it can be very wrong. My classical one is that I was hopping on an aeroplane, I was in a suit, I'd run a workshop in Sydney, I was flying back to uh, Brisbane, and this fellow's going to hop next to me. He's got peroxide of hair, he's got uh, rings out of his nostrils, ears and lips, and his clothes are all different colours. And he looks at me dressed in the city, he probably thought the same about me as I thought about him. I wondered where the hell he'd come from. <laughs> we got talking. He was a retired naval officer. He'd risen up through the ranks, so he started off being a sailor to become an officer. He had a computer science degree and an economics degree. He didn't fit in one of stereotypes. And I've just had an interesting one. Yesterday I left my wallet in the taxi and there was equipment, there was nine, about a thousand Fiji dollars in that wallet. And I virtually had written it off. I said, I won't get this back. Five, and I didn't take the numbers, or I wouldn't have a clue the car. Ten minutes later, that fellow drove back and said, look, he left this in the, in the car. And I stereotyped the taxi drivers. He would have benefited, you know, his family would have benefited quite well from that $900 odd dollars. But, uh, and I, 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 I gave him $500 as a bonus for being honest and so forth. I was on a $50. $50. But... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like 
so I'm just trying to check if you're awake or not. In some ways, I, it, I should have given because I've mentally written off that one. I, I, so that, was, that was gone. So in some ways, it probably was entitled to five hundred dollars. So okay, but like stereotype, all taxi drivers are the same. That therefore, that was the end of it. I never said that, and I was very wrong. I said, he, he, he sort of said, well, we work, you know, work out that you left us here, etc. Okay, so it's uh, intuition again. Too much focus on your past experience or your gut feel. This, and your gut feel is your past experience. Stereotyping, we just talked about that. Automation, where you put too much faith in the output from machines like computers. The computer says it must be right. So just talk amongst yourselves. Here are some of the biases you have for decision making. Okay, so that's an extreme case of uh, cognitive bias. <laughs> there are actually, like a member as a youngster, I used to watch those Mar and Park kettle shows, and they were brilliant. But, uh, that type of sort of uh, different ways of thinking and uh, etc. Okay, so when we come to the emotional intelligence, the self-awareness, you know your own emotions and how to handle them. And this is where yeah, people, good friends can help you out if you're not too sure. And a lot of people uh, see themselves differently. You have self-management, you, you can control yourself. Social awareness, you understand other people's emotions and their states. And you have social skills, you can handle conflict and so on. So that, they're the key ones of uh, EQ or... Uh, emotion intelligence. In my day, they used to call it character, but it's, it's now got a fancy title. Okay, that's all that is saying that <coughs> if you've got high IQ, uh, EQ, you, your chance of success is great. Especially at all. Some schools now are really working hard on this to increase, to increase the EQ of their students uh, and so forth, and working on that as much as the academic stuff. And there's a link between the two. Now, that's what I'm demonstrating you've got people got high EQs and also have high IQ. You've got them both, it's very, very powerful. So, prediction of success, all that was really saying, prediction of success is linked. High IQ will get you into a profession, higher the IQ normally, you know, if you want to do medicine, you have to have, normally have a high IQ, but then you have to increase the EQ. And that, I know doctors who are brilliant, who've got horrible bedside manners. Horrible bad time manners, and the people having skills, but they're trying to rectify that now. And at the bottom it says, if you're in a position of leadership, 85% are in the EQ or EI range. So that's a, that, a pretty strong statistic. <coughs> Again, this is just going through and stressing the importance of uh, EQ. So on the SQ, you have there are eight issues there. This is the spiritual intelligence. I have a problem with the name of that spiritual intelligence. That a lot of people then link it back to religion. I think it's got to go beyond that. It's not a partisan religion thing. But at the same time, I hope I'm not uh, offending everybody because obviously religion in its raw form is, is, is a very high thing of that. And I was saying before, looking at your values and your ethics and the way you handle things and so on. Uh, one of my associates in, the, in PNG just lost his job about a year ago, I didn't know this until it came out in the newspaper, he refused to sign a bit of paper that meant a certain politician could buy the land for $4 million and then on the sell it for $100 million. And he basically lost his job. Uh, that, and, and so that eventually came out 12 months after he lost his job. And, uh, so he uh, you know, took the, sort of the ultimate thing. But, and that's, that's one that is it, very much a personal thing and you've got to work out what's important to you. Okay. There's a bit more around the, the, the S. Q. 